the title of this video here that I'll be critiquing, it's only going to be a short little bit too, because this video is only a minute and 41 seconds long. It was uploaded five days ago. The title of the video is called Church Today Leads to Hell. I've done a video on this person before to show that he has a false gospel. And you'll see the statement he makes in, the, in this video concerning salvation. So we're going to uh, listen to what he says. It's going to get right to it. And we're going to line it up with scripture to show how it's false in accordance with the gospel. Following Jesus has nothing to do with going to church. It's easy to go to church and to play their fake games, to follow along with their programs. But make no mistake in fooling yourself. Church does not lead to salvation, and neither does following after a pastor. Okay, so far in agreement, right? We can agree with that. You know, going to church isn't going to save you following after a pastor. So let's go ahead and get into the rest of his statement. If you want salvation, do the hard work of repenting of your sins and following Jesus by his Holy Spirit. So there you go. If you want salvation, then you need to do the hard work of repent of your sins. So what he's saying is you need to do the hard work of keeping the law because sin is transgression of the law. So he's saying if you want salvation, if you want to be saved, you need to keep the law. We'll go ahead and play it back so you can see that I'm not misrepresenting this guy. If you want salvation, do the hard work of repenting of your sins and following Jesus by his Holy Spirit. So yeah, do the hard work of repenting of your sins. So he obviously hasn't read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself, but as a gift of God, not of works. At least any man should boast. So he says, do the hard work of repenting of your sins. And by implication, what he's saying is you need to keep the law since sin is transgression of the law. And what he's saying is that's the way to salvation. He's not saying that believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is the way to salvation. Like when the Philippian jailers were asked, what must we do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's what the apostles answered the Philippian jailer. That believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. He didn't say They didn't say do the hard work of repenting of your sins and you'll be on the way to salvation. At least for this guy, he's actually being honest by calling it a hard work to repent of your sins. That when, it, when you're referencing the law, it actually is a hard work. Some people say, oh, it's... It's not a work. It's not hard to repent of your sins. But to actually repent of your sins, it is a hard work because you have to take the worst that you have about yourself and you have to overcome it under your own power in the flesh by your own performance and efforts to be saved. That's what he's saying. And so he's calling this a hard work salvation. But when Jesus was talking about salvation, he said, Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, heavy burdened, for I will give you rest, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. And he was referencing the people who were under the law. And he's saying, come to me, where, you know, my yoke is easy, as, as opposed to being a hard yoke, which is the yoke of the law. And so follow the good shepherd here, this guy here that I'm critiquing, is saying that you need to do the hard work to get to salvation of keeping the law. And so that's not what the Bible says at all about salvation. It says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Notice it doesn't say anything about that you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. To be saved, you have to keep the law to some measure, to some degree, in order to have salvation. But it's about believing in your heart. Notice it says, with the heart one believes unto righteousness. We don't work unto righteousness, we believe unto it. He's saying that you have to work real hard. And by implication, he means so that you can get right and righteous before God. But Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says, To the one who works, it's not counted as favor, but his wages do. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. So according to the scripture, it's to the one who does not work, 
but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. That's believes on Jesus who justifies the ungodly. That's a non-guilty verdict. His faith is accredited to righteousness. So it's not to the one who works. But notice he keeps saying it's to the one who you, you got to work. You got to work real hard to repent of your sins. And then you get salvation. But notice Romans 4 verses 4 and 4. Chapter 4 verse 4 says to the one who works it's not counted as favor. But his wages do. And so he's saying you have to work to get favor. But it says it's not counted as favor when you work. But wages do. We'll play the slow-mo so you can hear it slow-mo. And I do that every once in a while for sort of the shock effect. If you want salvation, do the hard work of repenting of your sins and following Jesus by his Holy Spirit. There you go. Do the hard work of repenting of your sins. It's like this guy has never read the book of Romans. To the one who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. By implication, too, he's saying that you won't be not guilty. In other words, you won't have salvation because that would be connected. In order to have salvation, you have to be in a state of a non-guiltiness before God. But by implication, he's saying it's through the law because you have to work real hard to repent of your sins to get the salvation, to get this not guilty verdict before God. But the scripture says we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, that a person has a non guilty verdict by their faith apart from their performance and obedience to the law. So what he's teaching here is that he gets right with God through his own obedience and performance to the law by implication. And that's how he'll have salvation. But the Apostle Paul said, May I be found in him having a righteousness not of my own, which comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, even the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So Paul said, May I have a righteousness not of my own, which comes through the law. In other words, may I have a rightness with God that doesn't come through my own obedience and performance to the law but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, even the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, because that's a central part of the gospel, is that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And by faith we enter into the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness not of our own, through our own performance, or through our own obedience, or through our own working, but through Christ's life and his work and his performance and his obedience. And we enter into his righteousness, where Romans chapter 3, verse 22 says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all those who believe, and there is no difference. That we're collectively and equally made righteous by our faith in Christ Jesus. There's no difference between us, and it's through his obedience. Just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. So through the one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. We're collectively and equally made righteous, the many, through the one man's obedience. And there's no difference between us, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all those who believe, and there is no difference. The other thing that I'm constantly pointing out with these people is their lack of understanding of the functionality of the law. Because the scripture says the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to faith in Christ, but once you've been justified by faith, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. So the law had a purpose. The law was a schoolmaster, and it leads us to faith in Christ. It shows us that we're guilty and we need a Savior. And all the repenting of our sins and all our trying to keep the law the best we can is filthy rags before God. And so we need a Savior. And that Savior, savior would have to justify us. And that's what the Scripture says. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace toward God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to faith in Christ, but once you've been justified by faith and not guilty verdict, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. But notice he's saying that when you have faith, you still have a relationship to the schoolmaster by which you have to work really hard to repent of your sins. So in other words, you have to work really hard to keep the law the best you can to some measure. And he's saying that's the way to salvation. So he's saying the law is the way to salvation. That's what he's saying. Your obedience to the law is not saying Christ's obedience to the law is the way of salvation. 
because that is the way of our salvation is, is Christ's perfect obedience to the law that just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. Christ's obedience under the law, we enter into that perfect life that if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of the son, how much more having now been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? His perfect obedient life under the law is what saves us. And that's what makes us right and righteous before God. We enter into that life by faith. And it's an eternal, everlasting life. John chapter 6, verse 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has, not might have, not could have, not possibly have, but has everlasting life. So Jesus says, once you believe, you have everlasting life. It's a life that you can never lose. It's eternal. And it's not based on your hard working of repenting of sin, that you have to work real hard to repent of your sins as the way of salvation. If you want salvation, do the hard work of repenting of your sins and following Jesus by his Holy Spirit. So yeah, he's just saying that do the hard work of keeping the law. It's an indirect way of saying it when you say do the hard work of repenting of your sins. But if you're not under the law, then you have no relationship to it by which you have to then have obligation to it by which you get then righteousness out of it. Acts chapter 13, verse 39 says, Through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things through which they could not be freed from through the law of Moses. That the one who believes is freed from the law of Moses, the thing that would show that you're guilty and unrighteous. Romans chapter 7 says, Brothers and sisters, you have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might be joined to another, that is, him who has been raised from the dead. So we have died to the law. The thing that we would show we're unrighteous and that we're guilty before God, we've died to that very thing. And he's saying that you have a living relationship to it indirectly by saying that now you have to do the hard works of repenting of your sins in order to be saved, in order to have salvation. So what he's saying is that you have to keep the law to have salvation. You have to repent of your sins, to keep the law, to establish your rightness before God. To be righteous before God and have rightness in his sight, then you're going to have to repent of your sins and work real hard to achieve that. And that's going to be up to you. It's going to be up to you trying to establish that. Well, Paul said about people like him, I testify about them. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness or seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That when we come and put our faith in Christ, we get his righteousness and the law comes to its end. That we have died to the law, we've been freed from the law, we're not under the law, and the law has come to its end. Not that we have to work real hard to keep it in order to be saved and to have salvation. If you want salvation, do the hard work of repenting of your sins and following Jesus by his Holy Spirit. The other thing to point out to, about this is notice he's say, uh, saying this is the way to salvation. This is how you will eventually get saved is by what you do by repenting of sins, which would have to do with your works, and then you will be saved eventually. But the scripture says by grace you have been saved through faith. So the Bible uses past tense language that by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. So it's not of ourselves, but if it we had to work real hard to repent of our sins, then as the way of salvation, then it would be of ourselves. And it would also be about our works because he's referencing the law. He's saying that you, know, you need to repent of your sins, which sin is transgression of the law. And so he's saying you need to keep the law. And this is how you ultimately have this non-guilty non verdict and have salvation, but by the works of the law. No flesh will be justified in his sight, for only by the law comes the knowledge of sin. No one will have a non-guilty verdict by the works of the law, for only by the law comes the knowledge of sin and guilt. 
only by the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's why we have to be freed from the law, die to the law, not be under the law. And the law has to come to its end. So it no longer shows that we're guilty because now we are the righteousness of Christ in God and we are not guilty before him, having reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. But see, he doesn't believe that, that we are holy and in God's sight, free from accusation and without blemish. He believes it's going to be dependent upon your works and performance, which means he's standing under the banner of Christianity. He may believe certain things about Christ, but he doesn't believe the main thing. And that's what he accomplished on the cross for us is a perfect reconciliation and a holiness. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, by his will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. So according to the Bible, we've been made holy one time and for all time. It was through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did it. And if you deny that, then you're simply boasting in yourself. If you deny that what Jesus did on the cross, he, that you deny that he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. If you don't accept that's the means by which we're made holy in God's sight without blemish and free from accusation, then you'll boast in some other means. But Paul said, may I never boast except in the cross of Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So this guy, he clearly has a false gospel. He's boasting in himself and his performance. And it's only going to bring about condemnation on the day of judgment. And even now he's under the wrath of God. The scripture says, whoever believes in the Son of God hath the life, but whoever does not believe in the Son of God does not have the life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So he's not believing in the Son of God for salvation. He's believing in himself. And since he's believing in himself and his works and performance under the law, it'll bring about the wrath of God. Scripture tells us that the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. So the law brings about the wrath of God, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. And that's for those who believe. Through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things to which they could not be freed from through the law of Moses. So we're no longer under the law. We've been died to law. We've freed from the law. The law has come to the, its end according to scripture. So there's no law for us. Law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. His appealing to the law is just going to bring about the wrath of God on the day of judgment. When on the day of judgment, God per pulls out the perfect stringency of the law and then judges this guy according to it. And then this guy finds out that all his best attempts and efforts to be tried and be made righteous or justified or not guilty under the law, not only nullified the grace of God, but just showed that he was utterly condemned by his own works and performances. And not trusting in Jesus Christ alone, but actually using him as a stepping stone by which he was just trying to earn his own rightness before God, independent from Jesus. And his boasting would ultimately be in his self, if that was the case. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 tells us, By his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became from us from God righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and wisdom, so that just as it is written, let him who boast, boast in the Lord. That our boasting for being made righteous and for our sanctification and for our redemption is because of Christ and we're placed in him. For he's the perfect life lived before God and the substitutionary death in our place. The once and for all, all sufficient, all time, perfect sacrifice that nothing could be added to to make it any better. But his boast isn't in Christ alone or his faith in Christ alone, but in his own performance. He's added himself into the equation, which then... You know, you just clearly have a false gospel, as we just uh, clearly showed. And I went a little longer than I meant to. But if you went this far, I hope it blessed you and that you hope, ha hope you have a good night and a good day. So whatever time it is where you are, whatever time you catch this video. So God bless you. Peace to you and take care. Then I got me down.